Hello everyone, uh, oops, and welcome. Uh, welcome to today's session. I am echoing. I hope everything's um, okay on your end. Sorry about that. I had to get rid of my uh, laptop, which was echoing. All right, so I hope you're doing great. Just let me know in the chat box where you're from and um, anything else you'd like to add in the chat. Uh, this is uh, Nellie Deutsch, and I'm coming to you from Toronto, Canada. Um, and our session today for Moodle MOOC 4 in the month of June is with... Dr. Anita, who's right here uh, with the star. And a little bit about Anita while people are coming in. Anita is Associate Professor of Education at the Advanced Programs and a Flex Master of Arts in Teaching Coordinator. She's taught uh, various courses in human development and applied psychology, as well as educational research. Her research interests include e-learning, knowledge media, virtual learning, space design, learning communities, and culturally responsive practice. And if you'd like to know more about any of these areas, this is your chance to ask questions, and learn. So I see our presenter is here. Uh, so let me pass on the mic to Dr. Anita, who, um, no, you didn't lose me, I just ran out. I had two laptops, <laughs> you're not gonna believe this. I had two laptops lying around. One was uh, under my feet, actually. Uh, was uh, just under me and one was on my desk and it was echoing and I couldn't get rid of it So I got rid of one put it in the living room and it was still echoing from there So uh, that's why I was running around trying to get rid of it. It's almost like, you know, kill it Before it does any more damage So really great to be here. I'm glad to have you uh, with us and <laughs> Yeah, you have no idea what goes on in the background here uh, so it's really exciting. And I see that you came in um, without the co-presenter link. I see Dr. Remish is here too. Wonderful to see you from uh, around the globe here. Yeah, authentic feedback. All right, so uh, this is being recorded. This time it's recorded through... Um, not through Camtasia because I'm having a lot of problems with it. So through QuickTime, and the problem is QuickTime is that it picks up all my um, my keyboard taps. It's like tapping. So which is why I wanted to be in two places at the same time. So this is what I'm doing here. I'm uh, maximizing the, oh, Jason's here too, the live class so that I can uh, see our speaker, and uh, apparently I, I saw you, Anita, and then I lost you. Maybe you went to get, oh, there you are. Uh, it's really great that WizIQ now has uh, this new feature. Well, it's not that new anymore, but it's a relatively new feature. Hello, Anita. A new feature, which is called uh, a co-presenter, which means that uh, presenters can come in anytime days, months, uh, once the class is set up to get things going and practice. So welcome. Welcome, Anita. 
uh, I'm going to let you uh, take over and I'll be in the background if you need me. Okay. So I would just talk and assume people can hear me and that you'll let me know otherwise. So as Melanie mentioned, my name is Anita Zeidemann Sudro. I'm here in Oregon in a small town just outside of Portland uh, at a university, Pacific University in the College of Education. And I'm excited today, let's see if I can find how to advance my screen, there we go. Uh, I'm very excited today to be sharing with you um, some new work, uh, it's a fairly new area for me related to openness in education. And uh, basically what I'll do is I'll talk a bit about uh, what I've been working on and share a few examples. I'm not going to do a live demonstration unless we have time and I'm able to figure that out, but I, I do have some screen captures that, that I'll share with you about some of my work. So uh, welcome and uh, so let me just start by talking about what I mean about open education. So in today's context, Open education can be described as iterations of uh, social and technological innovation that reduce barriers to access and create multiple opportunities for educational practice. And my goals for today are to start with a, a historical and a philosophical overview because openness actually has tradition in, in education. And uh, I'd like to start with the philosophical and historical overview uh, and talk about how these have informed today's current technological context, particularly as they have uh, informed open learning, teaching, content, environments, and design. And then I'd like to share, as I said, some of my examples just to give us some food for thought of how educators in traditional settings, which I think is uh, still most of us, we are usually in fairly traditional settings, uh, how we might think about openness in our practice. So perhaps a fitting place to start is by asking the question, why openness? And as it turns out, the convergence of collective intelligence and ICTs, information communication technologies, particularly social media, they have led to the reincarnation of openness as the new paradigm of social production in the global knowledge economy, as you can see there quoted by Peters. And from this, a renaissance of open education, as we have seen it manifested over the past couple of decades, two or three decades, in terms of open source, open access, open content, and recently MOOCs, massive open online courses, uh, this has blown open our traditional doors of the academy and reignited questions in our community about the purpose and the future of education, as well as how well are we actually responding to the shifts that are occurring in broader society. And it is this shift that sparked my curiosity in openness, particularly this question of how do educators, how do I as an educator, pursue openness in practice within my closed uh, setting, my traditional uh, environment. So to get the bigger picture, I look back and at the philosophical and historical origins of this thing called openness. And I found, I found lots of interesting articles, uh, one in particular that uh, I'll refer to here is on the role of openness in education and historical reconstruction. The authors, they look at earlier time periods going back to embryonic forms of open adult education of the late Middle Ages, 12th century onwards, uh, before education became institutionalized. They note periods of open and closed practices uh, are inextricably linked to shifts in power between institutional uh, structures in place and the individual. And so one example they use of this uh, were the, uh, was the open culture of the, the coffee houses in London around the 1800s that were hugely popular as places for informal learning and sharing of information and how these gradually transferred into 
close private clubs uh, and exclusive societies. So there's an example of a shift from that open to close. And the authors further characterize openness as a social, cultural, and economic phenomenon that is neither bound by institution or national belief. So the philosophical values inherent in openness, and here we talk about things like freedom, autonomy, individual transformation, social progress, or knowledge for all. These all have a rich foundation in progressive works of people like Rousseau, Montessori, Dewey, Piaget, Maslow, Rogers, Humanist, and many other notables. And these pioneers helped to establish a clear vision of education and its relation to meaningful life that's quite distinctive from the more closed traditional practices, such as behaviorist or cognitive approaches that still influence educational systems today. And so though this open project, this project of open education has its roots in enlightenment uh, concerning universal access to education, information, and, and uh, knowledge, it has received this new expression that I refer to through the advancements in information communication technology. So today, or at this time, my work really looks at uh, education, open education in terms of uh, learning, teaching, content, uh, and learning implement. So that's where I will focus today. And here on this slide, I've just pulled together some of the more recent expressions of, uh, of openness in education. So let's start with open learning, because open learning, it embodies certain assumptions about what the learner is or what the learner is capable of doing. And in the open context, and, and a lot of these will sound very familiar as constructivist values or humanist values, but in, in that open learning, the learner is central. The principal lead in the education enterprise, and the belief is that the learner possesses a natural desire to exercise agency, to solve problems. They're innately curious. They like to engage in decision making. They want to explore the world, tend to prefer hands-on kind of learning experiences versus strictly textbook kind of approach. And so the learner, therefore, should be viewed as competent, should be encouraged to curate knowledge and pursue uh, the social lifelong learning, which transcends the boundaries between formal and informal uh, settings. It's suggested that cooperative learning uh, is is a way to provide multiple opportunities for both individual flexibility and affinity to learning communities, as opposed to collaborative learning, which supports a high engagement at the cost of limiting individual flexibility. And it's seen this cooperative freedom as supporting one's given right to, to, to determine their own learning and uh, it's enabled by allowing flexibility through time, space, pace, medium, access, and context. And I think this idea of cooperative learning is quite noteworthy because education loves collaborative, uh, learn the collaborative learning model. And uh, this notion that enticing learners to be cooperative instead of necessarily collaborative, because we want them to collaborate, but this idea of being cooperative still allows the individual to have some ownership in the process uh, and the idea is that you know you allow them to have their individuality but you encourage them to share their learning and to engage in the community with others. The other thing I'll mention here on the slide about learning is that in the construct constructivist tradition it's seen as an active uh, an active thing and it's social if you think about Vygotsky he talks about it being social as opposed to being more passive in the traditional behaviorist approach. But I also, um, in referring to George Seaman's work of a connectivist learning approach, he believes that we need to have a new learning theory in a digital context that embraces this notion that learning is about making connections and that learning can actually reside outside of the individual and live 
within entities such as networks and organizations. So it's a sort of a new extension of learning theory, uh, whether you want to call it a learning theory, I think it certainly seems to be getting a lot of traction. Uh, but this idea that we need to think about learning and redefine it in a digital context. Uh, open teaching. So based on this view of the learner, uh, in response to this idea that the learner is primary in the education activity, then the role of the, the, the teacher, again, very constructive, is a facilitator, uh, is somebody who uh, provides instruction not based on prior conceptions, but based on observations of the students within the learning context. Uh, it's, uh, the teacher emphasizes personal achievement, reflection, freedom of choice, as opposed to predetermined outcomes. And uh, of course, the teacher is promoting self-directed learning, uh, inquiry, is modeling transparency and authentic problem solving for their students. So they're engaged in this, this activity of learning with their students. And perhaps one of the most pervasive developments in openness is this penetration of open content. It, it influenced everybody right through the closed, um, the closed, more traditional environment. And so this access to content uh, has gone, undergone monumental expansion because of technology. Uh, and it's really encouraged this ethic of sharing the development of um, permissions or usage rights that Wiley refers to as the five R activities that people in open environments and use content are allowed to retain, reuse, revise, uh, and remix and redistribute content, very unlike the more traditional view of proprietary you know, ownership and, and, and closed or holding on to keeping information private. And what I have here is just an example of uh, an open education resource that I use in my technology class. Uh, this is open. Uh, I've been developing it, it for a few years. And it's just a wiki. It's a wiki site. And it, you can see it's got themes there. And this is something that I started. And over the years, my students have contributed to. And it's also the portal um, where I link to uh, my courses. So I, I sort of connect it to my my learning environment for my courses. In terms of open environments, this has been another conceptual shift that's quite significant for today's practitioner. Because as we uh, shift from traditional face-to-face -face classroom into the online areas, we have uh, these, these ecosystems or these participatory cultures that we're creating online to support uh, co-creation of information, uh, communication between learners, teachers, content, and to, to encourage uh, this notion of online learning community development. So in the open environment, the educator has options for bringing virtual learning environments into the classroom, ranging from closed institutional systems, right, so you can, uh, or to more open uh, internet-based social media that are, that are you know, um, free or m most times you can get really great free ones. Uh, and it's an interesting opportunity to create things in a way that you see fit. So you can start with something like Moodle, which has a lot of structure, particularly if you are new in online teaching, uh, or you can go uh, to something out on, on the internet using social media and create something from scratch. And what I'm showing you here in terms of as an example of an environment is a portal that I've created for our uh, Flex program. And uh, basically, this is a portal that pulls together three different programs, as you can see in the tab at the top. One of them is FED. One is the dual uh, licensure program, which is uh, the ability to add an endorsement to your initial teacher license. And then the other one is the Gen Ed uh, licensure program. And this portal or uh, open environment is something that we have set up for the students. They can come here, find their calendars, find links to their courses, uh, syllabi, other environments that teachers are using technology in their teaching. 
But here on the main page here, you can see there's also a community blog. Uh, they can link in their e-portfolios here. So for example, when I'm coming to look at their work, I can just come here and then go out to their personal learning environment. There's the document cabinet for sharing information. And the other thing that's open about this environment is that I have given the students access. So it's not just instructors who control this environment, uh, which is the case in more traditional frameworks like uh, Blackboard, or, or you know, is that the teacher usually controls the environment. Here, the students actually have access and they can uh, assign or they can add things to this environment, share their work. So that's looking at open environments. The next thing I'll, I'll look at is uh, open design. And uh, again, there are lots of tools that we can use in, in designing, uh, but there's some real considerations uh, to be made for, for uh, open environments. Because there are so many possibilities, some would say it, there are too many. It can just be really overwhelming. It is really important to think strategically about how best to use, organize these frameworks for understanding the possibilities and the challenges that are inherent in effective technology integration. So on the one hand, as I was referring to something like Blackboard or Moodle, there's a design in place there. There's a structure that you can go by. But if you're interested in exploring uh, openness beyond those uh, more closed or structured environments, uh, you really need to think about your design, and some have even suggested a systems thinking approach is a really good way to uh, to really understand and embrace the complexity of educational practice in a digital setting. So, uh, in this example, here, which is actually a course we we just finished uh, about a month ago, so I'm I'm looking at the data and uh, I, I'm starting to to unpack some of that. It, this is. I think probably uh, the most open that I have been so far in my practice, and I've been doing this for oh, a good, a good 16 years now, technology specific. I've been in teacher ed for uh, about 20 years. But what was uh, different for us with this open design here? This is something that I did with a colleague. Uh, first of all, it was interdisciplinary, so she was from occupational therapy and I'm from education. But what we did here was we used the ADI design framework, and, and I'm sure a number of you might be familiar with that model, ADI standing for Analyze, Design, Develop, Implement, and Evaluate. So we used the ADI design framework to pull together Moodle and an open education resource. And what you can see here on the left are basically the design features of this environment. Uh, so we use the uh, Moodle to uh, enroll our students. Uh, people dropped off their assignments there, and we had uh, basically the scope and sequence of the course. But then we linked out to an open education resources where we started with resources, and then as part of the learning process, the students added in their own uh, resources, and they shared that to the community. The other aspect that was really different and open in this was that the students set their own learning goals. So typically, we have learning objectives, but then within this, we wanted to empower students to be able, within a theme, to decide what they knew, what they wanted to learn, how they wanted to demonstrate um, you know, that, that they had an understanding of that. So we had some loose guidelines, we had some structure, but we weren't rigid within that structure. We were open and we wanted them to set their own learning goals. Um, and then we developed our modules. Uh, we had a, a, a professional journal that they kept. The back ends of this were Google Docs. So we pulled together a number of different tools uh, in order to create this open environment at that, as I said, uh, had Moodle. I guess you could call Moodle sort of at the center of it. So how can educators in traditional settings think about exploring openness in their own practice and respond to those significant shifts that are occurring outside of the academy? 
using a system thinking approach, uh, we developed this reflective tool uh, that takes the elements of a system, the, uh, the, the elements are, basically if you think of a system as comprised of elements, relationships, and purpose, what, we, what I've done here is I've developed this tool looking at certain elements uh, that evaluators can use to evaluate levels of openness within their own process and hopefully use it from that to potentially explore areas that, that they'd like to improve uh, moving forward. So if you would think about using this uh, as a sliding scale from close to the left to more open on the right, you could look at each of the elements. So just as an example, that open design that I showed you in the previous slide, if I were to plot it along each of these elements, uh, lens, you know, it was sort of somewhere around the constructivist uh, level, just, you know, going on uh, with maybe a little connectivist. The learner was quite involved. The teachers were definitely co-constructing with the students. The content was initially teacher-generated, but then pushed the slide up towards those generated. Uh, assessment was definitely partially achievement-based, but it was also mainly about their learning and personal reflection. And then the environment was trying to achieve a learning community kind of model. The systems level, it was flexible, creative. And access was, uh, this in this particular case, was online. So it was purely online, no face-to-face, -face, and it was synchronous and asynchronous. Okay, so when I think about that, and as I said, I'm starting to do my initial analysis of that, that experience, I would say we had a fairly open course, but some interesting things that we, we learned in the process, uh, just to give you a little heads up of some of the things we were finding, is that it's very foreign. So it was unusual that the students, they found it kind of difficult to think about, well, what do you mean, what are my learning objectives? You know, you have, they're so used to doing what we want them to do that it's, uh, it's interesting when you say to them, well, what, what do you want to learn from this? You know, maybe you know something about this already and you want to go deeper in an area, or what, what are your thoughts about your role as a learner in this environment? Uh, the other thing I'll mention too, that from a teacher perspective, it felt strange too because we are used to having a little more control and structure, and in this kind of open environment, uh, you need to be willing to let go of that. You know, even including letting go of ownership of your learning environment, uh, usually we control the environment, and in an open context, the idea is that you are, you are sharing that, you're allowing uh, learners to bring in their environment to contribute to the environment for the, the community, the learning space to kind of evolve and develop. Uh, let's see, I think that sort of brings me to the end. Um, so basically what I've, I've tried to do here for you today is I've tried to give you a little bit of uh, the philosophical values and, and history that have informed openness, in particularly in education. And, uh, and I've tried to show you some examples where I've been exploring openness in my own practice. Uh, there is no doubt that the digital revolution is significantly impacting our work. It's significantly impacting the way we teach, it's impacting the way we learn, it's impacting the way we as educators need to think about preparing our learners to engage in, in society. And because institutions can tend to be slow to change, uh, it is kind of incumbent, I think, on us as educators to uh, to be proactive and to think about these things, and even if we are in closed environments, to think of, well, how can I improve or make some change happen in, in my own practice and start thinking about aligning with some of these shifts that are going on in broader society. And on that note, I'll end it. Uh, thank you, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Thank you, Sunita. It's, uh, it's, it was really nice to hear. I'm hoping to hear it face to face in uh, Finland, or at least uh, some of it. Um, yeah, I, I presume that it's a third. Great, great. So I presume that it's a 30 minute session or, or is it longer? 
no, I think it's a it's it's a brief paper. So I think they give you twenty minutes. Twenty minutes, right, right. right. 20 minutes, I think, for yeah. Yeah, a lot of I have I have a few yeah. questions. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say it'd be fun to see you. And, and <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We'll be able to finally hug. Um, what I was wondering, I have a question, and uh, feel free to add questions in the chat box. One question is, have you had any um, opposition? Not from students. I know how students feel. And you've mentioned that they felt awkward being asked to do things that they're not used to. But what about uh, other teachers? Did they ask you what you were doing? Were they curious? Uh, did they ignore you? Did they attack you? What, uh, what kind of response did you get from your colleagues? Yeah, well, I think in some ways my colleagues are used to me doing things a bit differently. You know, uh, it's the kind of thing, uh, any of you who are educators, you know, once you're in your classroom, you're kind of, especially in higher ed, you're well, maybe in any classroom setting, it's kind of your own little world and you're able to, to do things. And unless uh, there are course evaluations that are scathing and saying you're awful, uh, I don't think you usually get too much flack. But this idea of openness, I actually, uh, I haven't, it's funny, I've, I've engaged in the topic more with that colleague who created the course of in-house professions than I have with my own colleagues. Because they're used to me using technology and wikis and They've seen me share them, and, and then over the years, they've come to me and asked for help or guidance, you know, and, and how to think about setting them up. Uh, and uh, But in terms of openness, they're not quite there yet. I haven't quite shared this out with my colleagues. Um, I'll probably do it, actually, after the conference, because this is my first time presenting on this topic. So would I, if I were to think about it, I don't imagine that I would uh, get a lot of flack from my colleagues. They might look at me a little strangely or say, how's that work? Because it is a bit different. But I do also have some colleagues who are very constructivist. Uh, in some cases, they're way on that, that end. I teach ed psych too, so I see the value of the full spectrum of more closed or behavioral, traditional kinds of uh, approaches to, to learning, as well as the completely open constructivist and the connectivist things I find that uh, Stephen talked about. Um, but I do have some colleagues totally know they all constructivist and open. But of course, doing that in practice is very difficult, you know. So yes, it'll be interesting to see the reaction. So far, no hostility, which is good. Yeah. Questions here. Uh, I see people are discussing how things are uh, in their neck of the woods. Seems that um, Australia is quite open. I know New Zealand is too. Uh, certain parts of the world are more open to open, and uh, some are less open. I think Australia, because maybe because of um, Wiki Educator in New Zealand, um, and and in fact, I think because maybe because of uh, Moodle as well. Because of story, of thinking of Moodle too, because they did uh, Moodle did start off in Australia, in you know to bridge the gap so that um, people who lived way out could um, manage to learn online. Yeah, and so my understanding too of Moodle is that its history is looking at a more constructivist approach. How do you create an environment that's structured but is a little more open uh, than some of its predecessors like uh, the now defunct WebCT or Block. Um, I don't know about desire to learn, but my, my assumption is that they're all fairly similar. Uh, so on one hand, the structure as a teacher is really welcome. It's great that I don't have to enroll my students, that my, my system at the university just does that once students enroll. It's nice to have some structure. Uh, Moodle does have some of those. It's tried to incorporate some social media tools in the environment. Uh, but it's so easy to just link out and connect to other social media that are out there on the web, which which is what I tend to typically do, especially in terms of content. Uh, as I said earlier, that is a significant area that even if you're in a closed institution, we're all going out to the internet, we're all seeing the value of, of accessing those resources, and there's such a great ethic and movement out there around sharing, you know, open courseware, or open resources, all of these these wonderful things out there, how could you not 
take advantage of that, you know. So even if you are in a traditional environment, you are, I'm quite sure you're, you're, you're bringing in these kinds of things that are open. I mean, they come from that open ethic of let's make this accessible to everybody. You know, so there are some exciting possibilities for using Moodle, especially if you're not as experienced starting there, but then linking out. And then in my own practice, I just over, uh, I'm going to say the past easily seven years have been creating open education resources. And I basically have one for each content area that I teach. And I just develop it and add to it over the years. My students add to it when they come up with great resources. Um, and why not just make that open to the public? You know, it's, we, we tend to be nervous about sharing or making, you feel maybe a little more vulnerable just putting yourself out there. But um, there's also, of course, that side to social media where everybody's putting themselves out there. At least you're putting yourself out there in a, in a, you know, a way that can be of, um, of use and benefit to other educators or other students. That vulnerability of being a, uh of seeing what you're doing. You know, teachers were used to having things in their own classrooms and not letting others come in or let their work out. I'm wondering, um, since uh, many of the uh, participants are learning to Moodle, I mean, this is a Moodle MOOC and we do have a venue, Moodle 2.6 for beginners and non-beginners. And I'm wondering about some of your experiences with Moodle, if you're using the latest Moodle. Um, how do you, if you could just describe a little bit, uh, your approach to the use of Moodle? Yeah, so I think uh, I go back to, even though, as I said, the great thing about Moodle is that you have structure there. Uh, I think referring back to that slide where I talked about design, uh, this is something that I think a lot of teachers don't necessarily give consideration to. You know, maybe they, the teachers often think about their content and we think about oh, we've got those learning objectives, we need to meet the content and their assessment, those kinds of things. Uh, but in, especially in a complex environment where it might be face-to-face -face plus online, uh, whether it's hybrid or fully online, you know, the, this integration of technology, it's important to, to sit down and think about your design of your learning space, which would include perhaps face-to-face -face plus online. Online is part of that learning space, even though it's virtual, you have to think of it as part of your classroom, right? And so I think uh, in my experience, I would just really, I, the first thing I sit down is think about the design. What do I want this environment to look like? Uh, I, for educators who are just coming out, I often, in my tech class, we talk about models like TPAT, right? It's just a nice framework to think about, okay, what is my, my technology, my pedagogy, and my content knowledge? And normally, I probably would start with the content, think about the pedagogy, what are my strategies, uh, that, you know, my objectives, these things, what, you know, how, how am I going to, what kinds of activities am I going to have? And then, you know, well, what tools will I be using to support that? Uh, and because then you can start thinking about, like we do, for example, why I think flipped construction is so uh, popular is that it allows you to decide there's a structure there you're going to send them to the videos first and then we're going to come and do those activities in class that you need the face-to-face -face for so when you can design your environment think about how you want to set it up then you can really think about the parts that work well online and the parts that you really want to get to because you want the face-to-face -to, -face to be rich but you also want the online experience to be rich too so that is my experience with Moodle is, is starting off at front line, maybe, you know, brainstorming, planning that, then setting out my structure because it is fairly sequential, right? So then you can do your blocks and things and then you can um, start thinking about how you're going to link to uh, outside resources, activities, or readings, whatever those are. Do, thank you. Um... Thank you. Do you use all the activities available or do you have some favorites or does it depend on the courses that you give or all of the above? Yeah, yeah you know, I'm so, I like the media. So I tend, because, I think it's because I teach technology so I, I'm out there playing with things. I tend to link those kinds of tools in to Moodle. I think a, st a staple, of course, is, is uh, the threaded discussions, but in my mind, uh, because I'm working with teachers, future teachers, 
I'm always thinking about what they're going to have access to when they're out in the field. And I'm also interested in them getting practice using these tools. So uh, although I might use, for example, the discussion in Moodle, um, often uh, I will tend to have them create their own blog or some sort of way that, that they are reflecting on their own work and then use maybe the discussion can bring uh, those pieces where they contribute together or again I will use a, a community blog and I will and that all of their blogs will link to it or a site you know so I think I, I definitely prefer using the discussion in Moodle to like a site discussion but if you're really heavy into discussion then to me an after school is a blog and I and I haven't used uh, the blog feature uh, the I think there is a blog feature in Moodle right I haven't used that but I have I've tried the wiki one too um, but again, you know, the way I look at it is that Moodle is really good at organization structure. The assessment piece is really strong. It's really great to be able to evaluate, put up assignments through Moodle, and then go straight there, uh, grade them, and, and uh, have the, the marks there, and students can see how they're doing. Uh, there are some things that, you, that Moodle does really well, right? And then there are other things that I might choose other tools. Um, that I feel are just there because that's their focus. Blogs are a unique tool that just are very good at doing those kind of journal discussion kinds of things. So I would tend to go to the tool and use the tool that's right for the job. No excellent core, heart of a course, you know, that virtual learning environment that's sort of everything, you go there first, right? And you, and you get your head around what's going on, what you have to do. Uh, and then if you want to, you can link out to other things that are out on the internet. Well, you can bring, um, you can actually uh, bring your blogs. If you have a collective blog with your students, you can bring it into the Moodle and then you can just uh, add it to the courses, which is really, really great. So Moodle is going towards a lot of openness in addition to being able to share. And this is a, this is a question, maybe, maybe you'd rather not answer it. But there is an opportunity for everyone who creates a Moodle course or gives a Moodle course to share it uh, in Moodle.com, I believe, or .net, um, so that others can use uh, your course. Would your university allow you to do that kind of thing, to let others use your course? Yeah, that's a really good question. You know, I think my, my sense is that the university's first concern is around FERPA, and if there are no issues there, then, you know, and the, and the participants are consenting and they're, you know, which is always something you have to think about in the design, you know, how you have to really, you can't, it, again, the idea is you can't just impose it, you've actually got to uh, invite them in and, and bring them into this conversation, it's an exploration. But I, I can't imagine in my particular context that I would have trouble doing that. And you see, my response to what you just said, Melly, because you were, you were, you know, the expert on Moodle, you know, um, you use it a lot and you do these moves. But to me, that's very good thinking of Moodle to do that because one of the barriers for me was, especially at Blackboard, it's Moodle, most schools that my students teach in when they graduate, they don't have access to, to Blackboard, so why am I spending a lot of energy getting them in an environment that, that they're not able to use? I want it to be practical. So if Moodle's now recognizing that they need to have an open policy where you can, once you've, you've gone, you can, uh, you can access and share, then I think that's excellent. And I can imagine teachers saying, yes, I want to continue using this kind of structure in my teaching because, as I said earlier, there are so many tools and sometimes you don't have the time or you say, how do you keep up with everything? It's nice to have a good structure, a good design that you like, and then you can just reuse it, you know, and with each course and as you use it more and more, you just you explore new things, you might pull in a different tool, but using that framework, that Moodle structure, is it's solid, it's strong, it's a great way to organize your course. It helps keep your thinking organized, it gives you a place to, to hook everything in. So uh, that's a great move on Moodle's part to, to make it open. Well, for a few years, but now they're making it more easier because you can do it straight from your, uh, your Moodle. 
but I don't know, it's your admin actually that is able to do that. But if you have admin rights to your course, or at least a manager's right uh, to your course, you can um, you can do that yourself. And the users, of course, you don't have to ask the users because they're not there. But the thing is that if your students paid for the course, I mean, they pay to take these courses, <laughs> that's, that's a thing that they might not agree to. Why would, you know, someone else get it for free? Right. But what they're paying for are those uh, that personal uh, relationship with the instructor, and this is why that whole MOOC, uh, you know, debate and discussion has been interesting, because it is different when you're just attending a MOOC or an open environment like this. Example of if Moodle was open, uh, it's different when you're just attending on your own than when you are enrolled in the course and you're getting that that personalized attention, right? Um, I think ultimately, ultimately, that's what the student's paying for, is knowing that they've got that, that personal relationship with, with the instructor and, and the other students in the class are a benefit too. But I, a lot of students still don't think about the social aspect of learning. A lot, young people are very social and using these technologies in their personal lives, but they tend not to think as much about the social aspect of the classroom. Um, we tend to still have to think that I'm attending this course, what can I get out of it? And of course in education, we're there, well, it's about also what you give back, right? How you contribute to the community and, and helping them to see that in engaging through cooperative learning with others, you, your learning is enriched. You know, but yes, what you're talking about, I don't, this is one reason why I stopped using Blackboard in our institution was because I didn't have administrator access. And so they would only turn on certain things for me, and I started feeling restrained by that. And it's like, well, I can go out and, and find other stuff out there that's going to let me be in control. And of course, that's what social media is all about. It's about the users being in the driver's seat, right? Having control, being empowered, being able to do things with it that, that meet their needs. And uh, you know. So it's an interesting paradigm shift. Right, right now, I know that my administrator wouldn't give me that access to Moodle. And it's funny that you bring that up, Melly, because um, usually in my experience in higher ed, the bottleneck has always been the IT department because they are always thinking, their mindset is I've got to support the broader university. So they don't like, uh, they don't like systems that are, that are new. They don't want you always using the latest software, not until they're ready for you to, because in their head, they're thinking, we've got to support us. You know, so you can understand why they might have a little more of a closed approach. But that's where I have my, it's not so much your question before, it's not so much my colleagues that I bump heads against. It's actually usually more IT, because I'm wanting to do things, and they're going, well, we can't support that, you know, if you want to do it, I guess you can go and do that, but we can't support that, you know, because they're thinking broad, how do we support everybody? And they also don't understand the educational part of using these tools. They're just looking at it from a systems management perspective. So you'll just have to learn to support yourself, to provide your own support. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Can. We can do it. Yes. And something like Moodle is a tool that gives us the power to do that. You know, so if you can access Moodle from the outside, uh, you know, then maybe that's, and it depends on your context. You might need to just say, well, if, I, if, it, I, if it's not going to get done unless I do it. And I think, and I know, no, you're all about empowerment and transformational learning. And that, so I mean, this, is, this is a way for you to to really transform your practice, uh, learn, you know, and, and engage your students in that too. It's very, it's very uh, exciting. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Yes, I am for breaking walls. Um, let's see if there are any other questions. There are lots of comments there. There's a, there was a comment there about um, personalized learning uh, from one of the participants who asked, um see if I can find it here. Um, I don't know, you could, if you see it. Yeah, I'm just trying to, the window is a little small. And I'm just trying to... Yeah, you can put it in the center, by the way. You can put your, you can uh, pop out your, um, your yeah. chat, and then you can just uh, maximize it, make it as large as you wish. 
and that it's easier to see. Oh, I see it. It's by Ella. Ella. You saw it? Ella as. I caught something like, uh, is it Lisa said about UK? It's much more open. Of course, the UK has that tradition of openness. I mean, they they really contribute to the open story, uh, you know, through uh, elementary kindergarten, exploring with model summer hill school, you know, uh, open university. Have this this epic there in their history for a while, so that doesn't surprise me. But no, where was that person? I Ella, Ella, person. Ella said you spoke about the role of teachers as letting students take ownership of the content. How does the teacher access differing perceptions? Um, access differing perceptions. Uh, well, so I, I'm not sure if I understand the question, but I will answer it in the way that I think I, I can address it. Uh, so the way that, so how do I access different perspectives? I think it's part of it's through the communication, you know. So for example, with that, I, let me just sort of unpack a bit how we did that, that um, the objective thing. So we had some guidelines, and you might have standards, right, that you know that you need to address. So you can't, you can't really deviate. You, you need to be able to demonstrate or feel confident that they're able to, to you know, to demonstrate they can meet the standards. But we'd have some ideas or we'd have an objective for a, a unit. Uh, but then, um, and so they could choose which ones of those they wanted to, to do, right? Because maybe they had some prior knowledge or experience with one or, you know, or they didn't have any, they were lower level. And we kind of thought about blue too in terms of those foundational bits of information that they, they need to have. And if they have some, they could move up and do more engaging kinds of higher level kind of thinking uh, engagement with these, these topics. But then we asked them to identify any objectives they had. And the way we, we learned from each other about it is that we did this in a Google Doc and we had access to that. So uh, we meaning me and my, my co-teacher. Uh, and so that's how we communicated um, those differences. Uh, nothing ever came up that was so opposing that we would say, oh no, that doesn't work. I mean, I think um, if that's what you mean by differences, nothing, I mean, it didn't matter if they had something different from us because we were open to saying, oh, okay, if that's where you want to go with this topic, then by all means, you know, uh, how's that going to look? How are you going to know that you've met that objective? Um, and the interesting thing about the course, uh, that this example, was that this was not for educators, which is where we live. It was working with occupational therapy doctoral students, um, but the theme of the course was how to teach and learn in higher ed. And so these people didn't have the education background. So part of our role was to model what we want to do to model how do you set objectives and how do you how do you you know design assessments to show that you've met those objectives and what kinds of strategies you know so in, in doing this we were modeling how people these people could think as, as future educators in higher ed think about designing instruction so I don't know if that addresses that question um, hopefully you can let me know if it doesn't Are MOOCs really open? <laughs> That's a good question. I, I do think, uh, again, it's, it's really, you know, every, even though the idea of MOOCs of, of being open, it, it depends on the design of your MOOC because we've seen, again, examples. Uh, well, if you think of the early, like the, uh, that early one, I guess it was at MIT, where it's a course within MIT, but then it's opened up to the world. And uh, there is a... There is a great article um, by Irvin, and I think it might be, I don't know if I took it out because I didn't quite refer to it here. It's, it's in my presentation I'm doing for the conference. But I think Irvin talks about uh, open access, an open access framework, which looks at how you can go from the face-to-face -to, -face to the really open technology where it could be face-to-face, -face, hybrid, and fully online. And whether or not something is fully open really depends on your design. And I and I actually don't even know if anything could be 100% open. I'm not sure. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you what's 100% open is informal learning. Right? When you go out on the web and you're interested in learning about something, uh, that's open learning because you're totally in control. You're going where you want to go. And that might include 
taking a MOOC, a course online, uh, and then doing some more of your own personal research. That's the full open end of the spectrum. As educators, it's hard. For, we can't do that. Our administration, you know, it's like, well, where's the credit? How do you pay, how do you pay to get someone to pay for that? You know, and this is one of the the lines that gets blurred in openness is between. And and this is why I think the resistance happens in institutions is because they lose control, right? It, and they want it to be closed where they can put a nice boundary around it and they know what it looks like and how, how to, you know, get their cost, you know, value out of it. And in formal learning, the really open stuff is it empowers the individual. They get to choose. Right? So MOOCs, I don't know if they're ever 100% fully open. They could be if it weren't attached to an organization, perhaps, that's trying to put structure on it. I don't know, Nellie, what you would say to that. I'm planning to open research it. Research. Yeah, open a action research is, um, is great. Yeah, open, open uh, is debatable because open would mean uh, CMOOCs that are kind of uh, informal, like you said. I think I totally agree with that. And that takes a lot of planning, which is interesting. Because unstructured uh, courses uh, take a lot, are more demanding, I think, on the part of the um, course organizers. Oh, yeah. And you also have to feel comfortable with doing things spontaneously. So you, it's, it's like you have to prepare and know your stuff, and then you have to be ready to let that go because your, your, your students might take you in completely different directions. You have to not be scared of to say, I don't know, or let me look into that. A lot of this is that constructivist kind of feel that we talked about earlier. That teacher in the classroom, or, and any of us who have taught in even informal settings, you have your lesson plans. It's great when I go up to see my candidates and do their student teaching. They've worked so hard to do these lessons. They've got a whole unit designed and this and that. They go into the classroom. They get into the first five minutes of their lesson. Something happens, and they have to completely go in a different direction. So even if you plan, uh, you know, and the ones who can't do that are the ones that struggle, right? So it demands of us as educators to open up our mind uh, and not to be scared to be seen as maybe not knowing, um, to be flexible, you know. So we still need to know our stuff, but it's and so that can be very stressful, you know. It can be very stressful. Yeah, that's where mindfulness comes in. You know, if everybody does mindfulness together, everybody is going to be uh, okay. Yeah, it takes a lot of um, organization. Um, I want to thank you, and I'm looking forward to meeting you uh, finally face to face, and um, and talking and uh, maybe doing something together in the very near future. So thank you for joining and. Um, Thank you. Really and I'm looking forward to going back to the chat to see, see what other people... Uh, so are. copy it, okay? You're, you're invited to copy it. And we can continue the discussions later on or next week uh, whenever we have time. If someone can add the, uh, the link to the chat, uh, that would be great. Chat copied. Okay, the chat's been copied. And uh, actually, it's called the Courseware in the, in the MOOC, the link to the MOOC. And uh, sorry, the course feed is the discussion. So thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. And, uh, and we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.